In September 1943, a Luftwaffe recovery crew worked frantically in a Belgian field, securing the greatest intelligence prize of the year, a relatively intact P-47 Thunderbolt with its massive Pratt and Whitney R-2800 engine undamaged. For months, German command had demanded answers about how American fighters were dominating German airspace, despite weighing twice as much as BF-109s. The captured engine would provide those answers. What Chief Engineer Klaus Weber discovered during systematic analysis didn't just explain American superiority, it revealed industrial capabilities that made German victory mathematically impossible. The P-47 Thunderbolt had become Germany's nightmare by mid-1943. American bomber crews called it their guardian angel. Luftwaffe pilots called it Der Jug, the jug, with mixture of fear and grudging respect. The massive fighter appeared over Germany escorting bomber formations, and German pilots discovered that attacking it was suicidal. It absorbed punishment that would destroy three BF-10-9s, dove faster than anything Germany flew, and maintained power at altitudes where German engines gasped for air, creating tactical situations where Luftwaffe fighters couldn't effectively engage without accepting catastrophic losses. German intelligence desperately wanted an intact P-47 for analysis. Previous captures yielded only wreckage, components too damaged for meaningful study. Luftwaffe technical intelligence offered rewards to recovery crews who could secure intact American aircraft, prioritizing the P-47 above all other types because understanding its capabilities had become essential for developing countermeasures that might slow the systematic destruction of German fighter forces that were bleeding experienced pilots faster than training programs could replace them. When the Belgian recovery crew reported a belly-landed P-47 with minimal damage, Luftwaffe Command ordered immediate secure transport to Reschlin testing facility north of Berlin. The aircraft arrived within 48 hours, covered by tarps, guarded by armed personnel. Chief Engineer Klaus Weber received assignment to lead the engine analysis team, Germany's finest engineers tasked with discovering how Americans had built a 2,000-horsepower engine that could be mass-produced reliably while German industry struggled to manufacture 1,700-horsepower engines with acceptable quality. Weber assembled his team with mixture of professional excitement and nationalist pride. Whatever Americans had built, German engineering would understand it, match it, perhaps improve upon it. The R2800 engine sat on a test stand in Rechlin's primary analysis facility, 18 cylinders arranged in two massive rows, the entire power plant weighing over one ton, dwarfing the BMW 801 radial that powered the FW190 and represented Germany's most successful radial engine design immediately suggesting that American approach to aviation engineering operated under completely different assumptions about acceptable complexity and weight. But the intact capture was just the beginning of shocking discoveries. Weber's team began with external examination before disassembly. The R2800's supercharger system immediately drew attention. The two-stage supercharger with intercooler was mechanically sophisticated beyond anything German mass production had attempted. Multiple gear ratios, automatic controls optimizing performance at different altitudes, and an intercooler reducing compressed air temperature to prevent detonation while allowing higher boost pressures, creating a system that maintained sea level power output to 25,000 feet where German single-stage superchargers lost effectiveness around 18,000 feet. German engineers had explored two-stage supercharging. Theoretical studies in the late 1930s showed promise. Prototype installations demonstrated improved altitude performance. But development programs were abandoned as too complex for wartime production. 
the mechanical systems required precision manufacturing, the intercoolers added weight and cooling requirements, and reliability testing suggested that field maintenance would exceed Luftwaffe capabilities, leading to strategic decision that single-stage supercharging with adequate low-altitude performance was preferable to complex systems that might fail under combat conditions. Yet here was an American engine with exactly the system Germany had abandoned, and it clearly worked. Intelligence reports confirmed thousands of R2-800s operating reliably in combat. The realization was deeply troubling. American industry had solved the reliability and manufacturing problems that German engineers considered prohibitive, suggesting that American production capabilities and quality control exceeded German assumptions about what was practically achievable in mass-manufactured aviation engines, fundamentally challenging the comfortable narrative that German engineering superiority would eventually produce war-winning technological advantages. Weber's team carefully documented the supercharger assembly. Photographs, measurements, material samples. They calculated gear ratios, boost pressures, intercooler efficiency. The technical data was impressive, but the strategic implication was devastating. Germany had made conservative engineering choices based on production limitations, while America had made aggressive choices based on confidence that their industry could manufacture complex systems reliably at scale, revealing that the two nations were fighting with fundamentally different industrial capabilities that determined what designs were feasible versus fantasy. Yet the supercharger complexity was nothing compared to what they found inside. And here's where it gets absolutely crazy. What Weber discovered about the materials in this engine will blow your mind. Hit subscribe because you need to see how far behind Germany really was. Systematic disassembly revealed metallurgical sophistication that shocked Weber's team. The connecting rods used steel alloy exhibiting both exceptional strength and surprising lightness. Laboratory analysis identified chromium nickel molybdenum steel with properties German metallurgists recognized as superior to anything Luftwaffe engines used. The alloy required materials Germany had limited access to. Chromium supplies were restricted after losing Soviet sources. Molybdenum was scarce. Nickel was rationed, meaning that even if German engineers could replicate the alloy formula, producing it in quantities needed for mass engine production was impossible, given strategic material shortages that were worsening rather than improving as Allied advances continued. The pistons incorporated sophisticated cooling galleries circulating oil through internal passages. German pistons used simpler designs with less effective cooling. The American approach allowed higher compression ratios and boost pressures without detonation, directly contributing to the R2800's power output advantages, but manufacturing pistons with internal oil galleries required precision casting and machining capabilities that German facilities struggled to achieve even in peacetime, and wartime production dispersal to crude workshops made replicating such sophisticated components completely impractical. Valve metallurgy revealed another unbridgeable gap. The intake and exhaust valves used heat-resistant alloys with standing temperatures that would destroy German valve materials. Weber's metallurgists analyzed valve composition and concluded the alloys required nickel and chromium in quantities Germany couldn't allocate to engine production, forcing German engines to operate at lower temperatures with reduced performance creating a cascading disadvantage where material limitations forced conservative operating parameters that prevented achieving power outputs American engines reached routinely. Every component analysis reached the same conclusion. American engineers designed assuming unlimited access to strategic materials and advanced manufacturing capabilities, 
German engineers designed within constraints of material scarcity and limited production precision, creating systematic performance gaps that weren't caused by inferior theoretical understanding, but by unbridgeable differences in industrial capacity and resource availability that no amount of engineering cleverness could overcome when the fundamental inputs weren't available. Materials were shocking, but manufacturing precision revealed deeper problems. The R2800's manufacturing precision represented the analysis's most devastating discovery. Weber's team measured cylinder bores, crankshaft tolerances, bearing clearances. Every measurement revealed precision exceeding German mass production capabilities. Cylinders machined to tolerances measured in ten thousandths of an inch inch. Crankshafts balanced to degrees that required extensive hand fitting in German facilities. Bearing surfaces finished to smoothness that German factories achieved only on prototype engines built by master craftsmen rather than production lines staffed by semi-skilled workers and slave labour. Weber called his team together to discuss implications. Could German industry replicate these tolerances in mass production? The engineers' answers were uniformly negative. Germany's precision machine tools were being destroyed by Allied bombing faster than they could be replaced. Skilled machinists were conscripted into military service or killed in air raids, and production had been dispersed to crude facilities in caves and forests where maintaining peacetime quality standards was impossible, meaning that the gap between German manufacturing capabilities and American standards was widening rather than narrowing as the war progressed. One engineer raised the obvious question, even if Germany somehow maintained precision manufacturing, could they match American production speed? Intelligence reports indicated Pratt & Whitney was producing over 2,000 R2800 engines monthly. Germany's total aircraft engine production for all types, BMW, Daimler-Benz, Junkers combined, was approximately 3,000 engines monthly with maximum effort, meaning that a single American engine factory was producing two-thirds as many engines as Germany's entire aviation industry, and those American engines were more sophisticated, more powerful, and more reliable than German equivalents. The mathematics were inescapable. Germany was fighting an industrial war against an opponent whose single factory output approached German national production. Weber's team sat in silence as the calculations' implications settled over them. This wasn't about German engineering failing to match American designs. It was about German industry being fundamentally outmatched in scale, precision and capability by an opponent whose industrial capacity exceeded German comprehension, making technical superiority strategically irrelevant when the enemy could produce adequate weapons in overwhelming quantities. Even perfect reverse engineering couldn't solve the real problem. Weber compiled production statistics that transformed technical analysis into strategic assessment, the R2800 represented more than an excellent engine. It represented American industrial philosophy, where German aviation prioritized performance optimization through sophisticated designs requiring skilled labor and precision manufacturing. American industry prioritized designs that could be mass-produced reliably by semi-skilled workers using standardized processes, creating systematic advantages where American adequate performance produced in overwhelming quantities defeated German superior performance produced in insufficient numbers. Pratt and Whitney's multiple factories were producing R2800s at combined rates exceeding 4,000 monthly by late 1943. Each engine represented 18 cylinders, 36 pistons, hundreds of precision components, all manufactured to tolerances German industry couldn't achieve. Yet American factories were delivering them by the thousands while German production struggled with simpler designs revealing that the industrial capacity gap wasn't merely quantitative but qualitative. 
American industry was building more sophisticated equipment faster than German industry could build simpler equipment. Weber calculated what Germany would need to match American R2800 production. The requirements were absurd. Double current machine tool capacity, triple skilled workforce, quintupling strategic material allocation, and assuming no allied bombing disruption. Even under impossible optimal conditions, Germany couldn't approach American production rates, and actual conditions were deteriorating, bombing intensifying, territory shrinking, resources exhausting, making the gap insurmountable regardless of desperate measures or technological innovations that German propaganda continued promising would turn the war's tide. The broader implications were inescapable. If Americans could mass-produce engines like the R2800, what else could they produce? Intelligence reports indicated American tank production exceeded German output significantly, American shipyards were launching vessels faster than U-boats could sink them, and American aircraft production across all types was approaching 100,000 units annually, while Germany struggled to maintain 40,000, creating a multi-domain industrial superiority that made German victory mathematically impossible regardless of tactical successes or battlefield brilliance. The numbers led to one inescapable conclusion. By the way, if these production numbers are making you realize just how outmatched Germany was, you absolutely need to subscribe because Weber's final report to High Command is about to reveal the brutal truth they couldn't ignore. Weber wrote his report carefully, knowing it would reach the highest levels of Luftwaffe command. The technical sections documented the R2800's specifications, analyzed its sophisticated design, and detailed what Germany would require to develop equivalent capabilities. But the final section addressed strategic implications that transcended technical analysis. Germany was fighting an industrial war against an opponent whose production capacity, manufacturing precision, and resource availability made German defeat inevitable unless the strategic situation changed fundamentally, and no technological innovation Germany could achieve would overcome industrial disadvantages that were absolute rather than relative. The report reached General Erhard Milch, Luftwaffe's head of aircraft production. Milch summoned Weber to Berlin for personal briefing. The meeting was tense. Milch demanded to know if Weber was certain of his conclusions, whether German engineering really couldn't match American capabilities, and Weber stood by his analysis while carefully explaining that matching American designs was theoretically possible, but matching American production capacity was impossible given current resources, territory and industrial capabilities that were degrading under Allied pressure. Milch dismissed Weber but kept the report. Other senior officers read it. Some rejected its pessimistic conclusions as defeatist. Others recognized its accuracy but couldn't act on implications that suggested the war was already lost. The report circulated through channels where it reinforced growing recognition among realistic officers that Germany was fighting beyond its industrial means against opponents whose combined production capacity exceeded German capabilities by factors that made continued resistance merely prolonging inevitable defeat rather than achieving possible victory. The captured P-47 was eventually test-flown by Luftwaffe pilots at Rechlin. Their combat reports confirmed engineering analysis. The P-47 was exceptional, fast, rugged, powerful. But the test flight's real significance wasn't confirming American technical achievement. It was demonstrating that America could produce thousands of these exceptional aircraft, while Germany struggled to field hundreds of inferior fighters, proving that wars are won in factories before they're decided on battlefields, and Germany had already lost the industrial war that determined everything else. The captured R2800 engine revealed more than American engineering excellence. It exposed industrial capacity gaps that made German defeat inevitable. Weber's analysis proved that technical sophistication without production capability creates excellent prototypes rather than war-winning weapons. 
Germany designed brilliant aircraft but couldn't build them in quantities that mattered. America built adequate aircraft in overwhelming numbers. Watch the next video for vintage planes' more untold stories.